So as I draw your attention then to Psalm 87, this is a psalm of the sons of Korah. It says it's simply a psalm. But because it's God's word, we know it's so much more than simply a song. It is God speaking. So please pay careful attention. This is God's holy and inerrant word. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. For the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the peoples, this one was born there. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing and preaching of his word. Please be seated. Let me take you somewhere. The anticipation of diving into a cheeseburger plate with onion rings and a chocolate milkshake from the Bantam Chef. The taste of a huge banana split with hot fudge covered with peanuts from the ice cream parlor. The Friday night buzzing of the stadium lights at Bruce Field for high school football as the weather just starts to chill. And my favorite, the uber, uber macho revving up of engines of Camaros and Firebirds and pickups as people cruise Maine after the game. Cassette tapes blaring Boston. I try to forget the mullets, though. Now, these are just some of the things I remember from my hometown, Pickens, South Carolina. What's so interesting to me is how vivid those memories are now as opposed to 20 years ago, which is really the halfway point from when I graduated 40 years ago. Why are those images so vivid to me now? Well, I think it's probably because I belong to at least three Pickens Facebook groups. Why three? All everyone talks about on those pages is how good it was to be from Pickens. People post pictures, they share stories, honor teachers or friends that have passed all manner of things, as long as they are all pickings all the time. Now, there is an irony that I find in this because 40 years ago, almost every one of us couldn't wait to get out of that podunk place. It's just to, to leave and never look back again. Now it seems like there's no grander thing to do than speak the glorious things of our hometown. Now, there's a lot of reasons to conclude why we do this and why so many others across the country do the same. Just just look on social media and and look for hometown pages. You'll find them. They are everywhere. Nostalgia, perhaps. But at the very least, we are reminiscing about a place that shaped us and helped define who we were and uh, ultimately became. A place where we felt we belonged or hoped to belong, at least, a place of security and comfort. Like so many of our longings in this world, I believe this is because God made us to live with just this sense of identity and security by living in communion with Him and in community with others who share that same longing. And even though we have fallen and are sinful, That longing is still there. As believers in Christ, we are like Abraham, of whom the writer of Hebrews said he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The Bible calls that city Zion, New Jerusalem, 
And that city is nothing less than the people among whom God himself lives now and forever. What what an, an amazing thing to even consider. It is the church of Jesus Christ bought with his own blood. And it is the ultimate hometown for those who are born again. And so it's no surprise that glorious things are spoken of Zion. And over the years, many outside the church have repeatedly written the church's obituary. And in the last few decades, even those within the church have concluded that, well, the church is a podunk town, that they can't wait to leave or at least transform in their own image. She has to be redesigned, she has to be rebuilt, she has to be reimagined, rebuilt to look sleek and gleaming, to be appealing because the old town just can't compete with the flash and dazzle of our culture. But those people are not only wrong, they're dead wrong. As in no other period of our lifetime, practicing the peace, purity, and protecting the message and mission of the church of Jesus Christ are critical commitments for us, his people, right here, right now, in the church, capital C at large, and in this church, Briarwood, and in all churches where Christ is preached. We must love Zion, the church, and recognize what is glorious about her, about her message, about her her mission, and about her ministry. We must long this for all individual local churches in all places, that the church would be awakened, revitalized. Now, Zion is spoken of first in the Bible in 2 Samuel 5, where we learn that David and his mighty men, before he was king, captured the city of the Jebusites, Jerusalem, and a stronghold called Zion on the highest ridge there in those mountains. And almost immediately after capturing it, it became known as the city of David. And he began to work to transform it. He brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, placing it in a a tent that becomes functionally the temple. And the ark represented God's presence with his people. And so bringing it there, it made Zion to be the place where God manifested his presence with his people. And so it became known as the city where God's presence was manifest. Zion, the place where God visited his people in a special way. He wanted to build a temple, but of course that fell to his son Solomon. And when Solomon built the temple, even though he realized what God had promised to do by manifesting his presence there, he he said this in his prayer of dedication, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I've built. Still, in his abundant grace, Zion as the temple city was the place where God chose to manifest his presence among his people in a special way. And I think that's what is referred to here in verse 2 of Psalm 87. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Yes, God is uh, omnipresent. And yes, God loves all the cities in Israel because they belong to the land he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And their dwelling there was a fulfillment of that promise. But as this verse says... Because it is where he has chosen to manifest himself. Above all the cities, this is the place the Lord loves and shows himself to his people. He loves Zion. Pastor Reeder loved the church. Oh, we know he loved Briarwood. But he loved the church because Jesus loved the church. And his heart was for those pastors and churches that were beleaguered for so many reasons, their own limitations and sins and the the squabbles that took place within the church leadership. 
the culture around them that seemed to harass them, a loss of vision. It was his heart for the church to realize that God loved the gates of Zion and out of that to transform their work in his power. And so we're called to have that vision and think of the glorious things that are spoken of us. We are the city of God. And so glorious things are spoken of Zion, as we see in the Bible, the physical city, because of who founded it, God himself. Verse 1, on the holy mount stands the city he founded. You can't get any simpler than that. We could say in the providence of God, David captured the city and it began to grow and all the things that happened in making it that center of worship were the foundation of God's providence. But it, and as astounding as it is to say that God chooses to make his presence known in any physical place or location, glorious things are spoken of Zion, not just simply because he founded the city, but because God himself lives in it. Zion is not merely a physical city God, God establishes as a central location. It's not merely God's intention to visit his people a mystery to even say that God can show up in one place more in essence than in another place, but the scripture tells us that he would manifest his presence. It's God's intention and has always been his intention to be with, to live with his people. It's the Emmanuel principle. From the very beginning, God does everything he can to communicate to his people bit by bit as each covenant unfolds. His desire is to be near them, and so he makes a way for them to draw near him, to him through sacrifice, picturing ultimately the final sacrifice of Jesus. And then he literally fleshes out that principle, Emmanuel, God with us in the incarnation as Jesus comes to fulfill it. And then he gathers us as his people so that he might live among us. We'll look at that in a moment. But ultimately his desire, as we see in the book of Revelation, is that the dwelling place of God is with man forever. Zion is the people of God, the church he established through the giving of his own son. And I believe the Holy Spirit may have brought Psalm 87 to the Apostle Paul's mind when he inspired him to write these words in Ephesians 2. We've seen them in the Confession of Truth this morning. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, Peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. And Paul is speaking here to those Gentiles who have been brought near, made one with the people of God in this covenant promise. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You, me, all who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I don't think we can possibly take in the magnitude of that reality. Yes, we believe that God dwells within us individually. He said, Jesus himself said, if anyone loves me, we will come to him and and make our home, strike our tent with, set our tent up with you. But this is God dwelling in the midst of his people, living even in the church. That's glorious. And it's something that the world cannot know. But what is also glorious is the reality that God's dwelling in his people is our source of sustenance and of everything we truly need to live. All who have been touched by this grace in any measure have come to see that God himself is that ever-flowing spring of life. Look at verse 7. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. 
Psalm 46, also by the sons of Korah, as this psalm is, maybe it could even be the same psalmist. In verse 4 says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. He is that stream. She shall not be moved. Now, in our world of a zillion brands of bottled water, and all of them having all kinds of different flavors, flavored water, and you buy it in a bottle, let that sink in. It's kind of hard for us to truly appreciate the critical sustenance of springs, life-giving springs. Maybe when the city has to shut the water off for some reason or the electricity goes off, then we realize how dependent we are on things like that. But it's never really a crisis moment for us because we have access to water everywhere. Civilizations were built on access to ready supplies of water, particularly a steady rushing supply from fresh springs. That's why they pop up around rivers and springs. Cities that were fortunate enough to have those springs within their walls could withstand sieges because they had sustenance. Or if they were deep water springs, they could even survive periods of drought. It hasn't been that long in our own history, really, that that's been the case. I'll never forget my grandfather taking us to the ruins of his boyhood home, a log cabin outside Cashers, North Carolina. All that was left was the roof and some shingles, some split cedar shingles. And he told us how he and his brothers had to go multiple times throughout the day down the hill to the embankment where the spring was. He said it was the best water ever. Cool. Clean. He says he remembers how glad he was that it was close by when he had to walk uphill with two buckets strung on a pole balanced on his shoulder. We take that for granted. The psalmist pictures God himself among his people with his life that springs and gives them life. He is the springs. And I love that it says singers and dancers alike say all my springs are in you. The joy, the worship that comes from realizing God truly is our all in all. Not just a song we sing. Solid joys and lasting treasures none but Zion's children know. It's no wonder that Jesus cries out in John chapter 7. If anyone thirsts, let him come and to me and drink. Whoever it believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus ultimately is that life-giving spring. God has chosen to dwell within his people. Zion, the church, and glorious things are spoken of us because we are the beneficiaries of that indwelling. He's given us the means of grace for by which he gives us himself as he springs up through the preaching of the word, the table of the Lord's Supper, the reading of scripture that proclaims to us that our sins are forgiven, that there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is with his presence among us as we gather together in worship that the writer of Hebrews says, we stir one another up to love and good works and encourage one another. It is because he is our life springing up through those means. These are glorious things and they belong to us and no one else. Now we could get proud about that but we'll look at that in a moment. No. How grateful and humble we are to know that we have this access, God's presence and the means which allows us to drink from him and grow. It's no wonder that the devil attacks the church then. It's no wonder he tries to cloud our hearts and minds to believe the lie that our springs actually run outside of this blessed city made of living stones. It's no wonder he wants us to doubt the importance of the preached word. Oh, well, we can get it online. Uh, I can listen to a sermon 
I don't have to come and gather and hear God's minister proclaim the word. It's no wonder he wants us to accept the lie that we can walk with Jesus just as well outside of this city as within, away from the gifts we need from our brothers and sisters and withholding from them the gifts they need from us. It's no wonder Satan wants us to think this way. So doing, we rob ourselves not only of sharing the glories together, of being the God-founded community of grace, but also of blessing one another by speaking these glorious things to one another. There's a reason why the Scripture says to build each other up, to encourage one another, because we speak the truth of who we are, the beneficiaries of grace, the people of God in whom He dwells and whom He is sanctifying. No, we're not there yet, but He who began a good work in us will complete it because he intends to move in forever. He intends to be with those who know him. And that is what's most amazing in my mind, perhaps the most glorious thing, at least from our our human perspective, that is spoken about Zion. Glorious things are spoken of Zion not only because God himself lives there, but also because those who know God live there with him. Now, it's at this point that we realize truly, starting in verses 4 and following, that we're not merely talking about a physical city. We're not talking about Jerusalem on earth. We're talking about the city of God, the spiritual reality of Zion. Look at verse 4. Among those who know me, I mentioned Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion, it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. Now, that's a list of Israel, of God's enemies. (laughs) It's a census of the bad guys. The nations that have harassed and conquered, plundered, and despised Israel for centuries. Any faithful Israelite would see this as a register of unclean people, strangers to the covenant. But the psalmist says these are the ones who are born in Zion. What in the world is going on? What kind of strange city is this? It's surprising. Even the temple court had a wall to keep the unclean nations from trampling where only God's people could approach. How can the psalmist begin to say, that these are born in Zion. It's because he isn't talking about the physical Zion, but the spiritual Zion. And the most profound truth mentioned here is not that Gentiles, God says Gentiles know him, but how it is that they've come to know him. Again, verse five, of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. The Most High himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the peoples. This one was born there. This is nothing less than the work of God's sovereign grace in the new birth. People say, well, the new birth didn't exist in the Old Testament. That's baloney. (laughs) There's only one way to know God, and that is to be born again, to be regenerated. They just didn't understand how it happened under the Old Covenant. But it's impossible to know God as a dead rebel. We must be made live saints so that we may know him and love him. And there's nothing more surprising than the idea that God takes dead rebels and makes them live saints who know him and love him. Enemies of God reconciled to God by God himself. But if I've come to understand this grace of God, as does, I think, every born-again citizen saint of Zion, the most surprising thing here, really, is not that Gentiles are said to have been born in God's heavenly city. There are examples of Old Testament Gentiles. The most surprising person that I should expect to see on the register of those born in Zion is me. Me. You probably remember that this year is the 250th anniversary of John Newton writing Amazing Grace. Pastor, hymn writer, former slave trader. One author said this about Newton and his view of grace. Newton's cry was amazing grace. Wrath did not surprise or offend him. He knew of his wretchedness, his own deep depravity. 
He was already convicted that he was fully deserving of God's justice. So it was grace that shocked him. It was grace that seemed so out of place. If there was any offense to the gospel, it was that God would take the sin of a very bad man like John Newton and place it on the perfect man, Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of people often will say, you know, I think we're going to be surprised at who we see in heaven. I don't believe that. Because if I'm there, I won't be surprised that anyone is there because if God can save me, he can save anyone. This one and that one was born there. And what's so interesting about that flourish of grace in that verse there is that when it says this one and that one, it's a Hebraism that you could translate that one and that one and that one, that man, that man. There are so many over and over again. Think of that picture in Revelation 7 in which the throng which no one can number cries out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That is glorious. And finally, in light of that truth, the size of the multitude, glorious things are spoken of Zion because of who passes through its gates. Now, of course, you surmise correctly, as you've noticed, the first subpoint of every one of these is God himself. Always make God the center. I would fail my homiletics class because of coextension. But I, God is always the focus. Gates, if they're more than just merely decorative, are designed to have an important function. They keep out the undesirable. They keep out the dangerous, the unwelcome. Why else do people have gated communities? In other words, they're, they're a first line of protection. But they also let in those who belong, those who have business or are honored in the city. Most of us have heard how in ancient Near Eastern culture, the elders and leaders of a city would sit in the city gates, having their fingers on the goings on by way of the, being aware of the goings in and the goings out. Our call to worship this morning came from Psalm 24. Look in your bulletins at it briefly. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. He goes on to ask the question, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Now there's debate among scholars as to what gates are in view, but I believe it could be both the gates to Zion, the heavenly city, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone and the ancient doors of this heavenly sanctuary, his people in which he dwells. The scene is that of the Lord, the King of glory, passing through the gates, entering triumphantly, having defeated his foes and leading his conquering army in his train, a glorious procession carrying the plunder and the spoils of victory. What is this victory? The victory of King Jesus over sin through his death on the cross, giving forgiveness and removing condemnation now and forever for all who trust in him. The victory of King Jesus over death through his resurrection from the dead to give eternal life now and forever for those same ones who trust in him. Well, what is the spoil? The people the Lord has plundered from his enemies. Rahab, Babylon, us. Those whom he has registered from before the foundation of the world to be born in Zion. Man after man, person after person, redeemed from death and rebellion, who he leads to their ultimate place of security. So that he himself may dwell among them forever. Listen to John, Revelation 21. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God, Emmanuel, forever. But the city is not only glorious because 
of who passes through the gates to come in. It's also glorious because of who passes through the gates to go out. Specifically, those seeking the ones yet to come home. I think this is so important for us to understand. If the register of those born in Zion is indeed the Lamb's book of life, and I think it is, then it is the register of all of those for whom Jesus died, past, present, and future, which in turn means that there are still those who have yet to know that they belong to this heavenly city, that they've been born in Zion. These are our brothers and sisters, and they're not yet safe at home in Christ, in Zion. So those who know their citizenship, citizenship is in Zion must go through the gates, as it were, out into the world and seek them, the waiting elect, the registered but not yet home. It's not complete. The city is not filled. Woman after woman, man after man, boy after boy after girl after girl, all registered in the holy eternal census, now wandering sheep, harassed by their own sin and the sin of others, who we need to bring home. Not too long after we moved to Pensacola when our kids were all under six, we went to Pensacola Beach one night when Lisa's family had come to visit us. We ate, and then we went to the boardwalk. Filled with seafood and ice cream, we ambled. As we've done so many times before when we came to Pensacola on vacation. Now it was home. So did thousands of other people ambling around when we realized that Bennett, around five, was not with us. At first, you, your, your heart skips a beat and you, you stop and scan and you call, Bennett, Bennett. And then your heart begins to beat and you begin to run all over the, the boardwalk, uh, panicking, but trying not to panic running into shops saying, have you seen a, a, a curly-headed boy with such and such a shirt? I don't remember the shirt, but a green bucket. I remember the green bucket. He got it at Flounders. He loved that bucket. No. And as we just scrambled all over, people began to realize what we were looking for, and they began to search with us. And a lady came up to me and said, are you looking for a boy with curly hair and a bucket? Yes. I saw him in the parking lot talking to a man ran to the parking lot. He wasn't there. And I ran back to the boardwalk just in time to hear that Lisa's sister had heard over a loudspeaker that a little boy was found and was back at the restaurant. And when we got there and ran to Bennett, we were crying. All we could think of is we have to take him home. Our family was lost. Now they're found. All Bennett cared about was whether or not we were going to take away his green bucket. But he was safe at home. We were ready to move mountains, to look like fools, and to wrestle down any and all bad men if necessary because our family was lost. They were out there, and they had to come home. How that perspective changes the way we should look at evangelism. Instead of seeing it merely as a task of obedience, and it is. Instead of worrying about rejection and, and, and denial, which happens, we're going out seeking our brothers and sisters whom God has registered as born in Zion by telling them the good news that Jesus Christ, their King, has prepared for them an eternal city and it's time to come home. And come they will because God loves the gates of Zion. And as Jesus said in his high priestly prayer to the Father, of those you have given me out of the world, I have lost not one. And as we go out the gates, calling with the master's voice, with the gospel, we know that he said, my sheep will hear my voice. If you don't know God through Christ, if you've not come to know and trust him, but you believe that his voice may be calling you, then, then hear this. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
On the cross, Jesus paid the full penalty for our sin, gave us his righteousness so that it is true that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he, through rising from the dead, has given us new eternal life. And now we belong to him and his people, the city. If God is calling you to trust in repentance and faith in him, after the service, there'll be elders and pastors down here who can talk with you and pray with you. And then also afterwards, you can get a, some material that will help you understand what it means to belong to this blessed, glorious city, Zion. It's time to come home. And for us who already know, it's time for us to love the church like we have never loved the church before and ask God to build her up like never before. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know you love your church far better than we love the church. But give us that love for one another in this congregation and for other congregations and for those not yet home that we would go and seek our brothers and sisters, our family who are registered in heaven but not yet home. And will you get glory as you build us up together as that place in which you dwell. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.